1937 and the feet of the aggressor nations are stubbornly set on the slippery path to the abyss. Storm clouds gather and the leaders of the Australian nation have realised the possibilities of a global war placing this country in a precarious position. Many thousands of miles separate us from the arms factories of friendly nations, so accordingly the foundations of a new industry were laid. This year, 1937, sees the first gun made in this country, a three-inch anti-aircraft, tested and found fit for service use. The outbreak of war and the actions which culminated in Dunkirk proved the wisdom of the government's action. We were on our own. In 1940, and private enterprise brings mass production methods to bear on another type of gun, the tank attack two-pounder. Some went to Singapore, some were lost at Rabaul, but many more were available and did fulfil their purpose. 1942, and to meet the challenge of heavier armour come the six-pounders, and still the race is on. 1943, and off the production lines in record time comes a gun capable of dealing with any tank in existence. The higher velocity, hard-hitting 17-pounder. Aircraft with higher ceilings demanded guns with longer range, so government factory point seven. Primary weapons in defending key points, these guns can deal effectively with high-flying aircraft. Quick-firing bofors were required for protection from hostile aircraft attacking at low levels. Australia still was equal to the task and these complicated weapons were successfully produced. The standard field artillery weapon of the Australian military forces is the 25-pounder gun howitzer. The standard 25-pounders have given an excellent account of themselves wherever they have fought. Their long range was suited to desert warfare, as Germans and Italians learned to their cost. Conditions in the Middle East permitted tractors to bring the guns right into the battle, and in the open country they could manoeuvre freely with the infantry. The roar of these guns gave the troops added confidence, and they knew that the shells would land right on the target. The coming of the Japs meant a dramatic change in the scene of war. From the straight roads and open spaces of the desert to the miry creeper lock fastness of the jungle, there could scarcely be a greater contrast. A man must fight with what he can carry and very little else. When the Japs crossed the Owen Stanleys to threaten Moresby, a few standard 25-pounders were dragged forward. It was a heartbreaking task. Through the eternal mud and rain of the jungle trails, inching their way over steep mountain peaks, they went a few miles in many days, but still they did their job. They gave great assistance in halting the Japanese southward drive towards our homeland. After these guns cleared the way for the infantry at Irobiwa Ridge, his drive was in reverse. But even with the exertion of maximum effort, the standard gun could not be taken far beyond the foothills, and so from there the infantry had to go on alone with what they could carry. Even with the assistance of faithful booms following up with ammunition and supplies, their heaviest weapons were three-inch mortars and machine guns. These were no substitutes for the 25-pounders. Bunkers such as these demanded heavier firepower, but jungle conditions called the tune. An entirely new and suitable weapon must be developed, and quickly. Australian brains and Australian industry rose to the challenge. Army designers got to work immediately. No time was available for the conducting of elaborate tests and investigations, and the short 25-pounder was born. Special steel was required for barrels, recuperators and many other parts. Australian steel mills produced it. Heat treatment gave this steel added strength to take the terrific firing shocks.
For each complete weapon, hundreds of parts are required, entailing numerous operations. Planing, boring, shaping, turning, welding. Each part given that precision finish which puts the shell right on the target. Largely, it was Australian-made machine tools that built the weapons. Guns need sights, and here, infinite accuracy was demanded. Australian craftsmen had to enter a field entirely new to them. The manufacturing of optical instruments had been the close preserve of two or three highly industrialised countries. Science and industry combined to produce optical parts with tolerances measured in millionths of an inch. The tempo of mounting and assembly was increased. As well as those for our own use, we needed many more for guns of all types that we supplied to the British forces, our sister dominions and our allies. Product of no one factory, components are fabricated by workmen in all parts of the Commonwealth. Small tributaries which go to form the river of parts on the assembly line. Guns Hirohito, plenty of them, specially made to deal with you and your little playmates. Check and double check is the order of the day on the assembly line. Every unit must be correct to drawing and completely interchangeable with all similar parts. Flawed or defective parts are rigorously weeded out for one unreliable gun could cost us many good Australian lives. Micrometers and calipers tell their story of accuracy and of work well done, but each gun still faces a final test. So they go to the proof range where they are loaded with a special charge much heavier than anything that will be used under service conditions. The test is severe, but so is the standard of workmanship high, and the guns are proofed ready for use. Little time was available to instruct crews in the new features of the gun, and although stripping a gun is usually a job for trained ordnance personnel, artillerymen can reduce this weapon to portable units in a couple of minutes. And reassemble it in even less time. Well, perhaps not quite so quickly as our cameraman can. It can go into places impossible of access to the standard gun, and the ubiquitous jeep can tow it along unbelievable tracks. If aerial transport is demanded, it can be carried either as a unit to be unloaded on the ground or in the form of components to be dropped by parachute. So a completely new technique is evolved and the word is passed that for the first time in history, artillery of this size is dropping from the sky. Australian gunners were so keen on the new idea that some of them didn't even have one practice jump. Their very first drop with a parachute was when they went down into action with the short 25. Paratroopers are being supported by some hard-hitting field guns for the first time. You can imagine the enemy's surprise and terror when guns packing such a wallop fell from the skies. The gun parts raced the sky soldiers to the ground. The Jap couldn't do it, we had done it. The 
short 25 is found in some incredible places, but this is just the start of a long trek. Through the jungle, over the mountains, by air and by sea, and always destination Tokyo. Contact is established. Commanders issue their orders. And platoons move forward into position. No pips are occupied. Targets are registered. Zero hour. Adding their vicious crack to the mounting crescendo, the short 25s have an enormous effect on morale. The demoralizing effect on the enemy can be imagined as within minutes of a beachhead landing, artillery flashes into action. Further back, standard 25 pounders add still more firepower. graphic picture of the devastation caused by high explosive. Small arms fire alone could never have shifted the enemy from this position. As each demand arises for new types of equipment and new methods of warfare, Australians on the home front and on the battlefront will join in hitting the enemy with what is needed. So these Australian paratroopers move off to face the future, wherever and whatever it may be, confident in themselves and confident in their arms. Arms made in Australia, by Australians and for Australians.